Hi everyone, my name is Zoe Dutrey. I'm here to talk to you about front-end development and in, more specifically web components and how you can integrate them into Django. So, I would like to introduce myself first. This is the first time I'm here and uh, to be honest, I'm not front-end developer or back-end developer, I'm something more general, which is called web developer. And uh, I do that for five years, and uh, it's only recently that I started to uh, program in Python and Django. I started in October when I joined Paul Conseil as a lead front-end developer, where I work on um, all kinds of services, like Autolib, which is an electric card services, and uh, I code a lot of front-ends on these projects, and also I try to help other backend developers to improve their skills in building front-ends applications. So, before introducing web components and what they are, I would like to take some time to explain uh, some problems we have with front-ends. First, building front-ends is something complex and really hard. We have to master a lot of languages, the most common ones are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But if we are not pleased to use JavaScript, you can use other open languages like CoffeeScript, uh, Dart, and TypeScript. So we have a lot of things to, to master. And also a lot of libraries like jQuery if you want to manipulate your DOM on the page. And if we want to go chart, we have another library to master, and so on and so on. And finally, we have a lot of framework to use. Most of you are backend developers, and you, I suppose you don't know too much HTML, so you will um, most likely use uh, CSS frameworks like Bootstrap. And other frameworks like Angular.js if you want to uh, build single application in your frontends. And when we are done with all these libraries and frameworks, we also have, also have to master various tools because, uh, because most front-end applications are, uh, can be built, compiled, tested, and deployed with Node.js tools like Power and so on. If you are interested in those tools, you can uh, uh, use the slides later and then click on all the links to get more information. And when we are done with all tools, we also have to ensure that the code in the front ends we have built is performance, small and scalable. And we also have to ensure that the code is pretty small, especially if we want to target devices like mobile, mobiles and, uh, and tablets like iPad. We also have to build front ends which are usable by everyone, not just the most kitchen ones or what we call the elite ones, we should also have to ensure that we do not want to fool them with dark UX patterns. And we also have to ensure accessibility in our frontends. That's something when we build frontends, we want to ensure that no matter your disabilities, we want to be sure that you can use them, which is color, uh, which is in terms of color, singing, hearing, and so on. And one important specification is area, and if you don't know anything about it, you should at least click on the link later and learn about it. And the three last things which are hard about building uh, good front ends are we need to ensure that what we build is compatible with various browsers like Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. Also, various, function, uh, various platforms like Windows, Mac OS X, all Linux distributions, mobile, uh, OS mobiles, and so on. And finally, all kinds of uh, devices like uh, mobile, and tablet, and desktop. And sadly, from my experience, I, I often see that we build frontends with all these requirements and everything by ignoring, by ignoring what, just, uh, what I just said. And in fact, we go online and look for ready to use library and framework. We have forget everything I just said and we pile them one over another and we have a ton of blue code if something is in the CSS or the JavaScript. And we hope that in 
once this part is in production, everything is more highly protected. And um, to be honest, it doesn't. If you build a prototype and you just want to try an idea, it will work. But for everything else, like enterprise application, in the next month, you will be uh, in a terrible situation and you will spend more time fixing bugs. And why? Because we have piled like different libraries together, and those libraries are not isolated like we have, uh, like we do in Python. So one library can override some features, some features from another one, or override some CSS rules from another one. And we don't have code for this kind of stuff. We cannot uh, test if everything works well, and when we update something, we cannot ensure that we wish it not been to use. So this is what we call usually an ingrained code, something that cannot be fixed during the time. And the second <coughs> thing is not a technical, but more about the user adaptation. Tomorrow we have a, a talk about user experience, and this slide is about it. In fact, when we take a library and we in a library to build a feature expect a client, we, ex we expect the client to conform to this library. We do not take the feature and implement it and then specifically for the user's need. And the user needs to learn how to use the framework of the library before to be able to do what he needs to do. So this is a strong problem. So what can we do instead? First thing is to stop creating math that we are used to doing. And then think about the requirements I told before. About accessibility, usability, performance. And then think like we always do in Python. It means creating reusable front-end blocks and use web components to do that. So now before introducing web components, I would like to introduce some terminology that will help you from the right of the presentation. So this is the Mozilla website. One example on the other. This is what the users see. And we have various elements in this page, like a title, uh, a sort of collection of panels, various buttons and form and so on. And this is what you can see if you look at the source code. So this is the HTML page. And if we want to be more strict about the definition, we can set can say that it's a document embedding elements. And an element, but well, you can you just see one here. In fact, you will see two. The first one is the select element. You can call it also a tag. The select element represents the list of the media website that I showed you I showed you earlier. And you also have the option element to decide what are possible open potential elements in this list. But these elements are predefined in advance and put into the specification, and this is good. But once we want to display in our front end something which is not in the specification, we are pretty limited. And we cannot add new elements like the set of tabs on the Mozilla website easily. And so what we do instead, then we start to add HTML, surface, and JavaScript. So this, this is the panel. And when you move over, uh, for instance, this one, you see the content of this panel in details. And this is how it is done on the Mozilla website. You have a complex <coughs> set of elements which doesn't describe what we want to show. In fact, we uh, used all, class, all classes on all elements to give some uh, description about what we want to show. And also, all these classes, if they are redefined somewhere else, they will be uh, used here also. So we can break all of the CFS on the, on the page of Mozilla.org just by changing the binary title for another page. And this is the JavaScript code which often comes to uh, generate the events for the panels. And this is just a sample just to show you. And everything is in the same document. 
forum, we are all used to have everything in the same place and everything can override another thing. And web components come into action to simplify this mess. In fact, HTML is predefined and you cannot extend it as you want. And web components is here to allow you to extend HTML. So it comes with four concepts that if you do Python and Google, well, you, you may be uh, used to you, and some other are pretty. So the first concept is templates. In fact, instead of putting HTML in the same document, you can redefine reusable blocks of uh, HTML template, and for that, you use the template element. So if I take uh, the example of the panel from the previous slide, we can extract all the elements that we need to make properly as web components, like the first level accordion. In fact, we use the template type and we define everything inside. It's really important to know that no browsers display and render the, the HTML which is inside the template. It just define it as elements, but it is not rendered. And you can uh, embed in this template everything like CSS rules or the HTML or specific JavaScript. And since uh, the accordion uh, is much more complex and contains panels and the title and contents, we can refer to the embedded elements just by including the content uh, element. This is a new the content element is a new tag and only uh, recent browsers support it. We can do the same thing for panel. Uh, we have uh, also included the list element and so on until we have specified all, uh, all ugly HTML as proper web components. The second thing, second thing about custom element is that I just used template to describe my HTML, but now I need to register them uh, in the browser. So we can use two things to, to do this. The first one is just using a new tag which is named element and, uh, and it's simple as that and we also we only need to give the name of the element we defined and we are done. And if we don't want to do this in HTML we can do that in JavaScript. This is uh, this two intrusion exists for a long moment. It serves also as defining uh, HTML5 elements in older browsers like Internet Explorer 8. The third concept about web component is a new one. It's called Chatodon. And for the first time, we don't include all HTML in the same document. The basic idea is we want to scope the HTML or the CSS rules to a particular element in the, in the document. And if, for instance, we have a document which defines panel class and applies the world rules, and we want to build a web component for display on the panel, and we want to redefine this, uh, these rules without relating with others, we can use shadow DOM. And this is plain JavaScript, there is no other way to, to define them at the moment. The magical function is here, in fact, we define, we extend, an object, uh, we ex, we, uh, extend the H element, the H element to include the magical function, and when this element is created, we will scope uh, our element in order to isolate the CSS from JavaScript. And this is how we, we, we use uh, this uh, scope in practice. This is the same call as before when uh, on the custom element slide, but we just specify uh, all the requirements with the prototype uh, department. And the last thing is the HTML import. Uh, the, uh, this one is important. For a long, we are used to <coughs> include with Django every, every, every template into the same page. From there, we can forget that. that. 
and in fact create specific uh, uh, HTML template and import them when we need them. So, this, so we do that with the link element. Uh, if, if you are familiar with front-end development, the link element is normally used to import CSS on the fly. And now with the uh, web component, we can also import uh, HTML uh, code. So how we can use it in practice? Well, you just need to import in your tem Django template the, the, the HTML uh, web component, and then you can use them as plain declarative. So as you can see here, we can, from a backend view, understand what we try to achieve, what to, uh, to build an accordion with one panel which has the title title and content text. And in fact, if you are not uh, comfortable with writing CSS and JavaScript, you can just use this markup and let another uh, front-end developer to put the CSS in, uh, on his side. And so, question that may pop in your mind is, is it really yet? The specification is still a draft, like any other specification from the WSVC, but several browsers vendors started to implement it. And today, as you can see, we have uh, various uh, browsers like Chrome and Opera who implement C almost completely. Everything which is a bit transparent is uh, being implemented. And other browsers like Firefox are just starting to implement uh, and support web components. And uh, other browsers like uh, Safari and uh, Internet Explorer don't do anything about it. So this is really annoying. But everything is not, uh, is not lost since we can rely on polyfills. Uh, if you're not familiar with polyfills, in fact, this is the kind of uh, library you can load to extend your web browser and add what, uh, all the features that have not been implemented yet. In this uh, field, we have two concurrent at the current time, which are Polymer and XTag. The first one uh, is made by Google and it aims at implementing all the polyfills to support all browsers if they are uh, if they are not uh, over, it means that they do not target uh, Internet Explorer 8 and other versions before that. They also provide all the necessary to use HTML and skip the JavaScript part I uh, listed previously. And they also provide examples to build uh, standard user interfaces if you need some example to start uh, to build your components. And this is what we obtain, uh, obtain with, uh, with web components and polymer and actually, which can support all recent web browsers, which is good to start quickly. The second, second uh, library which exists is much more simple and smaller. It doesn't aim at providing examples and uh, all the things included in uh, polymer but it provides uh, at least the minimum uh, to, build pol to build custom element with polyfills. And if you want to uh, still use this library, which is much smaller than the platform provided by Polymer, and you want example to start, you can look at Bricks. You can, <laughs> you can look at Bricks, which explains you how to build custom element easily. Uh, and unlike Polymer, if you use the X-Tag, you may have to be prepared that you don't add all features that you have in Polymer. So it adds in every browser to the support of custom element and HTML imports, but uh, nothing else. So we have a point where we can start to build web components and this is not over since we have to use the correct tools in this, uh, in this process to build good components. The idea behind components is to use them across our application and we need to ensure a certain sort of quality with our development. The same kind of thing we do when we build uh, Python code and Django application. 
So this is the same kind of tools. And the first one, we need to use something. Mm, I'm sure most of us don't really use in our packet device. It's packet, man packet manager. We need to package all our front end code. We don't, mm, mm, we don't have to put them in our static folders. We should avoid that at all cost. Um, as you can see, there is a lot of uh, package managers. The most, uh, the most used is Bauer. The other one should, uh, should be tried at least to see if they can match. Uh, we can also, and we should, if this is necessary, other libraries and web framework into our web components. But we should be careful with that because web components should be performant and in this context we should not add any extra library that would, uh, that would slow the performance and reduce the performance of our components. There are also preprocessors. For Python developers, it's much more easy to write coffee script than in JavaScript. And you should take a look, take a look at it if you haven't tried uh, coffee script. <coughs> SAS, less and Stylus are three solutions if you want to write CSS in the uh, programming way. You can use mixing, class, uh, object, and you're much more free to build something generic and automated and just for writing plain CSS. And also testing tools. That's something maybe some of you don't know. You can test JavaScript, human testing, and functional testing. Um, especially for web components, you should add test. Because everyone will start to use them, and if you broke something, you need to uh, notice it for. The last one is quality tools. Unlike Pyrene, uh, I'm not really fan of these tools. I use them, but most of the warnings that they uh, raise are not directly linked to potential error, just the, the, the most, most of the warnings are in fact just information about bad practice in your code. And does it work with Django? Well, it, it works good since in fact we build web component as application, as front-end application in Django, or in fact back-end application most of the time. The real problem with it is that most of the training is written in .js. So we need to change the way, our, the, way our, uh, the way we work, in fact, all our process must include those JavaScript tools. And if you are in an environment or where JavaScript tools can be used, like it was in our case at PolyConcept for a long moment, well, you will be, will be stuck in this process. So you need to extend your environment to include JavaScript tools. The second thing is web components are, app, uh, are applications and Django is an application. And you don't want to miss it. The common mistake when we build components, web components, is that we include them in the static folders. You should not do that. You use a package manager, package manager that is one of the package managers I uh, listed on my previous slide. And only when you want to package your application, your Django application, you will fetch the web components and store them in your project. But you will not store them from the beginning and you don't version them in the repositories. Data sharing. This one is not new. If you used to build content application for a long time, it's has always been here. So, in my point on this slide is that web components live as their own application and you should start from the beginning and you should include web API into your project with the framework like Django's framework specify. And you shouldn't ask your uh, Django application to send uh, some JSON feed to populate your, uh, your web component. For instance, what component can be a map, which display in a case with Autoly, uh, a set of stations in a specific city. And for this, we need to have a API. 
key for what component is just a field which validates a specific data time, for instance, you don't need an API. A web API. And the last thing is about security. More and more frontends uh, execute complex tasks and manipulate sensitive data like credentials and the credentials and personal information and you should not to store them in plain text. If you use local storage, which is an advanced full feature in HTML5, you are able to store many many data data, but the data can be retrieved easily, you just need to copy the file on disk and uh, you just need to copy them and you can read them uh, without any problem. You also need to ensure that uh, authentication is, uh, is in place, especially if your component interacts with the uh, API. You cannot ensure that someone will not use directly the API without uh, using the component. And also, you should have to be careful about the core status, which means if you host, host your web component on another domain, then the web, the, the Django application, need to be sure that the core headers are correctly sent. For those who don't know what the core is, it's simply a set of headers which allow which remote host can uh, access specific data and script hosted on a particular domain. And it's almost over. I would like to give you some recommendations about web components uh, since I just introduced them. The first one is if you haven't taken a look at front-end development in the recent year, well, do yourself a favor and try to build in a web app uh, with modern tools. You will see that a lot of things have changed. We are not building jQuery uh, plugins to build front-ends, and things have become much, much more complex. The second thing is Review your web application, everything you worked on, and try to find where you have built uh, codes which are ugly and very specific, something you may have commented as, oh, I will fix that later. And try, and if you see that, that some of these codes are pretty redundant and maybe make make generic, then after reviewing the application, start to build, from, build web components from this. And also, the front-end community and the Python community are two different things. The front-end community reinvents the world every week, and uh, this is pretty sad. And some of you are experienced for others, and I think that the experience you acquire during your career can be used to build better front-end tools and just and it will change the way that we use their tools. In fact, most of the time um, we use front-end tools like client and in fact we can improve them instead of just waiting for the perfect tools to come into action. And the last thing is we cannot build good front-ends today with just backend developers. Things have been so much complex and harder than before, and we need to hire, hire uh, people to do it. And I don't mean just front end developers, I also mean you need to hire people to design user interfaces and experience. Even front end developers have not the right background to build the interfaces or the experience over the time, and we need to uh, increase our team and the skills that our team has. Thank you.